I was thinking about Gary. Gary and I go back quite a number of Two years. Long. Yeah, quite a number of years. Gary, Gary, I first met. I was thinking about how I could relate Gary to perhaps somebody wider that we all know about. If I use the expression, why is it so, it should conjure up about a Julian Sumner Miller who was on television. I think he was either American or Canadian, wasn't he? American. But American. Um, and he had that very engaging enthusiasm. Now, I have seen Gary at work in a classroom. I've seen Gary at work with teachers. And in all cases, there is an enthusiasm that is infectious and contagious. And it's somebody who really enjoys his work, loves science and maths, and is also very keen to enthuse the students in the same way. Now Gary, I won't detail it very much, but Gary's been in the wars and so on, but has come through and now tells me he's with distant education. He might mention perhaps what he's doing. Um, <clears throat> and he has a group of remote students and so on that he's now helping. So it's a great deal of pleasure um, on behalf of uh, IMUG that I welcome Gary. I particularly and personally very much welcome Gary. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for the kind words. Um, it's probably more um, a domestic situation than a, a warfare conflict situation, which is probably more appropriate um, these days in terms of the injury. Um, a bit of a list. Um, that's, if you like, history. That's what's been done. And I take the view that there's so much more to do and there's so little time. So. We just want to get on with it. Um, a few people throw various awards around the place. The curious thing about the uh, DLTV, which is the um, Teachers Association for Primary and Secondary IT Teachers. Um, I was uh, on leave out of school and having all this time, and the only thing I could do was use my uh, index finger on the iPad. So I was online. And the voice typing is brilliant with iPad. Absolutely spectacular. So all these people haven't known that I've been on leave for three years. So um, when it came time for nominations, um, I got nominated for this award. And the fact that I wasn't in school was a bit of an issue. But fortunately, I was in school doing Year 12 IT in Term 4. So I was eligible to be nominated. And it's all happened. OK, all that is very well. and. It's one of those moments where the, eye, the eyes can begin to glaze over, but it's one of those things that you'll be better for it, he says. So that's the old school approach. It'll be good for you, um, maybe. So first of all, everything's normal, but very little is average, because the average is a measure of the middle, and as we know, none of us are in there. I'm in the tall, well, I was tallest 2%. My son's two inches taller than me, so he's beyond that. He's in the 1%. But uh, it's normal because it happens. And we've seen the normal curve and all the rest of it. And there's all sorts of numbers we can do on one sigma. And you've probably been associated with six sigma uh, production uh, efforts. And the people that understand the normal curve understand three sigma one side, three sigma the other side. All that, very clever. Yeah, theory, so what? However, if we go into the technology adoption life cycle, short search term as TALC, and give them names, we get innovators, early adopters. There never used to be a gap, but there is a very big gap there. Uh, a bunch called early majority, late majority, and in the American parlance, laggards. We forgot to do that, didn't we? There's always one in every crowd, and it's me. So the laggards, I'm going to ignore it, and you can ignore it as well. Or I should have done that. That would have been smarter. A moment to use the phone and the watch. All right, so the names, innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards, um, cover the entire spectrum in just about everything. In fact, 
uh, we're a little chameleon in that in some situations we're way up there with innovators, but in other situations we're way down there and we're not going to touch that at all, ever. The way I'm doing it is perfectly fine. There's a person called Geoffrey Moore in 1991 that formalised it all and introduced the idea of the chasm um, and that there's a disconnect that happens between early adopters and the early majority and that's where products disappear. They're going to be here, they're going to be the best thing, and then all of a sudden all the innovators and early adopters bought it and the market ran out and there was no more, and it disappeared. So you can list quite a few Apple products there. There's the Newton, there's the... Yeah, all right. Um, and basically the laggards never get it, or they never see it. By the time they work out such a thing existed, it's in the museums. Uh, there's a thing called S-curve. And that's where you actually add them together. So that orange, brand, well, depending on your eyesight, I suppose, that browny looking S thing that goes through the top of the peak there is the cumulative. So it gets to 100%. So to get to 50%, you've got to get to the top of the peak there. Now, the iPad in schools is running at about 25%, and it's only really got a few of the early majority. It is nowhere near mainstream. To get the mainstream, you've got to be over the peak and on the way down the other side. And that's hugely difficult. And so we've changed the names a bit. So now we've got technology enthusiasts and visionaries and pragmatists and the conservatives and then the sceptics. As in, it'll never work and I'm not going to touch it. For example, in schools, the sceptics, of which I was one, of interactive whiteboards, because they weren't interactive and they weren't whiteboards, has gone. There's no one is installing them anymore. The market's gone, because people have worked out they're just a big mouse pad on the wall, and you've still got to go up and touch the thing. Yeah, OK. I had my first whiteboard in 1996. It took about a month to work out that I'd rather use my Wacom Bluetooth tablet. But anyway, that's 20 years ago. Meanwhile some real numbers. We love numbers. We love graphs. Very confusing. Um, if your eyes haven't glazed over, we've probably got a lot to talk about. If your eyes have glazed over, we'll get to that in a minute. But part of knowing about graphs and knowing about Apple technology is knowing how to visualise the data. So instead of... Oh, that was good. Instead of just whacking people with something visual like that, you actually give them something to look at and something to follow. And so rather than talk about how to use Keynote, we'll just use it. And so radio took 50 years to get from introduction in about 1920, you can argue about exactly when, to get to 90% 50 years later, 97. And then we choose another one. Television took 30 years to get there. However, there are still some households that do not have television. And in fact, arguably, we could do, if it wasn't for the olds at our place, the over 60s, we wouldn't need television at our place because none of the children watch television. They don't watch it. They hate ads with a vengeance and they refuse to watch it. In fact, they refuse to watch some of the pay TV because that's got ads as well. They just record it and watch it later. They get one of their mates to edit it out so they don't see it twice. VCR, 20 years, even faster. Really smooth, if you like graphs. So VCR is probably one of the most successful inroads into the mainstream. Um, you could see a purpose. It was easy to connect, basically power and vision. Maybe an aerial if you really wanted a good picture, but hey, that wasn't essential. And the cell phone, which is 15 years. Now that stat only goes up to uh, 2005. And so updating these things is always a good thing. But I think it illustrates that if it's good, if it gets to mainstream, it's really fast. So this Bluetooth smart car, house, office, classroom, one imagines if all the edges are taken off it, will get adopted very quickly, between five and 10 years. So the next big thing on that sort of pattern is going to be five to 10 years. And it will be close to universal. In this regard, we talk about universal being 90%, because there's always 10%, it'll never do it. 
can't afford it, don't want it, choose not to have it. Meanwhile, the chief scientist puts a graph like this around. Year 12 participation. So this was normally education tonight, so here's your overdose of graphs for the month. So um, John Ainley put together the numbers. He's still doing numbers out of Melbourne Uni. Um, chief scientist put that around. You notice it starts at 1992. One wouldn't dare suggest they're choosing their data, but there's physics going lower than ever. And that's a terrible thing. But the participation rate, as a percentage of the people enrolled, is remarkably stable. Again, in 1992, there's this amazing bump. But if we go back to 1987, it was at 12%. And then there's this big bump in 1992. I wonder who caused that, Joan Kerner. And then it's sort of dropped off a bit. Then we get into some really good graphs, as in, if we get them to stay at school at year 10, hello, welcome. If we get them to stay at school at year 10, do they study things? And the answer is yes, they do. So the young women aren't convinced it's something they want to do. Again, starting around the 90s. The young men, however, have been convinced and it's now going back up from 22 to 24%. So it's about a quarter of the students stay on board. So that's pretty stable. So then the question is, what's going on? Well, all of a sudden in Victoria, there's Victoria numbers now, all of a sudden in Victoria in 2008, there's been an increase from year 11 into year 12. Year 11, they get a taste look at it say, this isn't for me, I don't want to go to university. The chances of being a researcher in physics anywhere in Australia, forget it. The chance of getting an engineer job anywhere in Australia, why would I bother? And that's the case. With cars closing soon, there'll be even less reason. However, the idea of detailed studies actually looks at ancillary areas that use physics. Okay, policing, nursing, people in an office using physics, not research physics, useful physics. So here in Victoria, 2008, is a bit of a success story, which doesn't get shown on the national graphs. However, if we really want to do numbers here in Victoria, we don't mess around with 1990 we go back to 1959. So here we go. In 1959, when high schools were first established, so Box Hill High School, fresh and shiny, the middle number is the total. And going along and increasing, then decreasing, and then increasing, and then a huge spike in Victoria in 1992. I wonder why the VCE was put in to get people to stay at school. And then it dropped off because the promise of VCE wasn't realised. So nominally now, in Victoria, 11%, you can look at the year sevens and say 11% are going to study physics. And it's been that way for over 10 years. And if you look back, it's been that way back in 1980s at around about 9%, pretty stable. And the reason for that is the capacity of the system to do more isn't there and the cost to build labs and buy teachers isn't there. So most schools run one class, the big places run two, Box Hill, Melbourne High run four, but that's about it. Everyone else runs one. Me at Distance Education, we've got the largest school in Victoria, we've got four and a half thousand students. Um, I've got 120 uh, physics students and uh, 85 IT students because their school doesn't offer it. So anyway. There's some numbers, we're finished with them now. These are all available if you have yet to see them. Bit of participation, how many people have heard of Gartner and have seen a Gartner hype curve before? Okay. Well, this is good because it is something new. New is good. Okay, there's a thing called a hype curve. I'm not sure what hype stands for. But anyway, a hype, hype, 
hyperbole, yeah, okay. A hyperbole curve in terms of talking up a product to get people to buy it and you always oversell it. And you love those salespeople that just sell the paint off the car and you think, just calm down, I'm going to buy it anyway, just give it a rest. But there's actually a studied pattern that the hype is really high and then people buy it and they say, why did you do this, it doesn't do that. The next model should do the other and so that's why version 2 comes in. And so there's this um, trough of disillusionment, there's names across the bottom, so there's a technology trigger, there's a peak of inflated expectations, there's a trough of disillusionment, there's a slope of environment, sorry, enlightenment as it gets a little bit better, the next version, version 3, version 4, and then the plateau of productivity where the early majority see it and they think, oh, this is all right, and they haven't gone through any pain of knowing which plug or which adapter or which, all of that, which we're all well aware of. So predicting the next big thing is the business of Gartner. They go around and ask thousands of people and they distill it and every year they put out their emerging technology graph. So here's 2007 and they listed a thing called electronic paper which was going into the trough of disillusionment after being hyped up and trying to sell it to people. 3D printing had just appeared. There's a whole bunch of others there. Um, you'll be able to search and find all these or I can provide PDFs of the like. It's, it's not uh, copyrighted at all, it's freely available, but it's interesting to just follow through. You notice there Web 2 under electronic paper, because Web 2 was actually a thing back then, and now we know it's really just a grab bag of a whole bunch of other things. If we go to 08, electronic paper's moved along a little bit. A thing called augmented reality has finally been mentioned. That's before Oculus Rift, in fact. 3D printing is still sitting there. They can't convince anybody that it's got anything to do. And in 09, augmented reality is staying there. 3D printing has disappeared. They forgot to put it on. Electronic paper is moving along. People like the idea. And so it goes on. Electronic paper and augmented reality. Autonomous vehicles get a mention for the first time. Halfway up the peak there. Over the peak now, we're about to get stuck into augmented reality in, that's 2011. And so all the problems with it, Oculus Rift had just been released, we're about to find all the problems with augmented reality. And sure enough, the next year it's dropping down into the trough and people aren't buying it anymore because it doesn't quite work. And consumer 3D printing is starting to go the same way. If you haven't got a heated bed, if you haven't got the right plastic, if you introduce a draft into the room when it's in the middle of the print, like if someone opens the door, the whole thing shifts by half a millimetre and you have to do the whole model again, you know, all that sort of thing. So people discovered that once they finally had one and then realised they should have got the bigger, heavier one with the heated bed. In fact, now they put a glass enclosure around it and the entire thing is heated, which the industrial ones have been like that for 10 years. But and you can notice there, enterprise 3D printing is heading off into being accepted. So Gartner, I put a URL there. Um, it's just as easy to search it. G-A-R-T-N-E-R. -E um, they took big data off because that's a grab bag and doesn't actually say anything. Uh, autonomous vehicles have moved to the stage now where they reckon it's within five to ten years, whereas when they first appeared, they were predicting 15 to 20. So these have been remarkably accurate, and they've been running them since about 2005, so a little over ten years, and they've been remarkably accurate in predicting all manner of technologies. These are really just the headline ones that grab the press release. So it grabs the, the headlines and gets a few new clients coming in. but. Uh, it's real. I find it fascinating to follow the predictions and then watch what actually happened. No doubt they could have done the same thing with colour television. It's only the adventurists that got one and people said, oh, it's too small or you get radiation or I don't like the colour of the cabinet or something like that. So moving on. The technology adoption life cycle, the reason why it's revised is there's a gap being introduced because getting across that gap is amazingly difficult.
not everything's automatic. So in Geoffrey Moore's words, simply put, the early majority is willing and able to become technologically competent. The late majority is not. When a product reaches this point in the market development, it must be made increasingly easier to adopt in order to continue to be successful. If this does not occur, the transition to the late majority will stall. So by way of putting this here, I'm explaining why the iPod got simpler. Why all those great features we liked, because we're early adopter innovators, we love them, that they've been removed. Because the only way to get it into the mass market, to get it past that 50%, is to make it so simple it runs itself. And in fact, it's so simple it'll run itself that we're now not talking about technology literate humans, where we're innovators, creators, and make it work. We've now got human literate technologies which are designed for consumers and they just work. And that's the transition, so that we've gone from creator makers into consumers, because the vast majority of the market are consumers. Probably the reason why the maker movement has raised, in, raised itself the last three years, because they can see this coming and they prefer to do something else. So that, that probably describes a lot of the functionality at the moment, where you say, I want to change the setting, and there is no control to do that anymore. The decision has been made for the consumer. And it's probably been focus group tested, and 80% of people are happy enough with that, and so that's it, that's the setting. How does that apply to education? Well, we're talking about a small group, 11%, doing physics, and we want more people to know more about physics. Well, actually, it turns out that 11% is about the early adopter plus innovator group. <coughs> They're the creator makers. And the others don't want to think and puzzle and work things out. And so we need to reassure teachers how to do the physics and engineering. It's not that hard. Well, they know it is, and they don't believe you. Um, so looking backwards or forwards is really just a matter of perspective, because some of us look at it and say, oh, we did this 20 years ago. But we need to repackage it in such a form that these new people think it's a new idea. The last thing they're going to do is pick up an old idea from an old person, but never, never mind. Online, they don't know any different. In 9.3, iOS 9.3, a thing called classroom was just slipped in there. And this classroom thing controls the iPad in the classroom. It basically turns the iPad into a Chromebook because you can switch it on, switch it off, and control it. And there's all these listed features, which I won't I just throw that up there and say, yeah, you could read them if you wanted to. But they're basically about focus on the work. See what the students have on their screen and share the student work on the screen, as in, Ian, your work's going on the screen now and I've controlled it and we can see that you're playing Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> you won't do that again, will you? No, you've been caught. Okay. So you do that a few times and it's gone. Oh, I knew there was a blank there somewhere. There we go. Did I make it that slow? I must have. OK, so here's the hype for it. The teacher guides the students through a lesson, can see their progress and keep them on track. Straight back to the late 60s, early 70s. Teacher-driven, if you like, classrooms. So there's a lot of pressure from all over, if we're going to get the late majority to pick it up, then we have to have the same app at the same time on all the students' iPad. We're part of the early uh, advertisement, if you like, marketing angle. Part of the attraction, for me, why I've got so many iPads on the table over there, is they can all do different things at the same time. So it's asynchronous. Just choose an activity, get on with it. When you finish that one, do another one not lockstep, you all do the same thing at the same time. However, again, the vast majority want this sort of thing. So the classroom, this new app, well it's not an app, it's built into the system, 9.3, helps teachers focus on the teaching. Whereas we'd argue that really it's all about the learning. 
what is it that they're doing? To me, worksheets are still worksheets. If you put them on an iPad, they're still a worksheet. And the flip classroom is fantastic, it's brilliant, it's clever, but a lecture is still a lecture. Being here live here now is one thing, watching the video tomorrow after, or the next day after Les has transformed it into a magnificent uh, movie narration of what could have happened, um, will not replace the fact that we're going to walk over to that table and mess about with some things. And the whole attraction of being in the room is so that you could actually mess about yourself and not watch someone else do it. And so this idea of the physical classroom versus the virtu virtual classroom, the challenge is to make the physical worth being there. Why would you be there if it's just going to be virtual? And that is the fundamental question. I'll just skip through these. Um, oh, no, I won't, because I was being clever with that. Um, what is all this telling us? It is telling us that you can have you can have iPads in your classroom and the kids won't be playing games. Overwhelmingly, that's the biggest problem with them because unless the teacher has something better than the game, the kids are going to play the game because they'll do their work in two minutes. Worksheets are easy. Just look it up on Google. The challenge is to create a worksheet that doesn't have a Google answer. Well, good luck with that. Ask a question, get an answer. So, no games. Get rid of games. A whole bunch of people are saying gamification, turn the worksheet into a game. Fight fire with fire. Well, good luck with that too. Okay, let's skip through that. Meanwhile, the ADEs thought this was really good. Um, you can look it up. Basically, it's iPad, Wheel, S A M R, which is educator speak. And it's talking about getting from the same old into something really new. And it's a way of transforming activities into things worth doing. Starting from the things that are required and transforming them. And the way to do that is choose an appropriate app. And there are literally thousands of them. And so these are, if you like, recommended apps. They all do different things. The different colours designate different activities. and. It's not a recipe of what to do, it's a guide for people who are getting a little bit lost. And so the ADEs I mentioned here, ADEs are Apple Distinguished Educators, of which there are 3,500 of us around the planet. Our job is to assist the early majority. A friend of ours, Gray Nashar, has made a particularly excellent uh, YouTube, I was tempted to show it tonight, but we can all look it up or show it some other time called the three carriage train. And it's all about the people in the first carriage helping the people in the second carriage and not wasting anybody's time by going to the third carriage. Because the people in the third carriage are the skeptics. And why have an enthusiast go and talk to a skeptic? All you're going to get is an argument. So let's go for world peace and keep the enthusiast away from the skeptic and just go for the early majority and ask them, what is it you want to do? Can I help? And so what we're approaching as ADEs is that we've got single point of entry. All the teachers walk in the room, all the students walk in the room. However, where they end up is diverse. The lockstep, one size fits all, same thing on the screen all the time, is looking to have one point of entry or multiple points of entry and one exit. The other way is diversity. You can follow your own interests. And of course, the attraction of a general device like the iPad is you can follow your own interests. You are not restricted at all. Um, so use fewer apps and know them well. iMovie is brilliant. iBooks is fantastic. Um, you just use this, a few really good ones and do a whole bunch of things. And so the distinguished educators, yeah, that's what Apple puts up. So it's all about working with each other, team building. People don't do things on their own. I'm not sure anyone ever did. There's always a support network of some description, even if it's just someone who goes and makes the tea and listens to what didn't work this time and then goes away and be, be quiet. Um, but the idea of a community, and now I've got a global community, I'm the moderator of the STEM group for uh, the ADEs, and the amount of brilliant material I see coming through literally every day from 
three and a half thousand educators who want to post something up for STEM. So it's not STEM, but it might help. And so we've just got this huge catalogue. And then the question is, all right, we've got all the good gear. Where is it? It's on iTunes, iTunes U, and it's free. Anyone with an iMac, uh, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, iPad can get access to this. It's buried though. It's in the left hand side, way down the bottom. It's a little bit like refurbished Macs that are buried on the Apple store. You don't see that easily. But the second one there, Apple Distinguished Educators Collection. We've been asked to create a book, an iBook with one best thing. So one thing we think is really good. At the moment there's 300 of them there and there's another few hundred coming through. Um, the iTunes courses, there's already 150 there and there's more coming through. And there are little snippets, a, a lesson or three lessons or a, a unit of work or something that someone has said, hey, this is how I do it, make contact with me if you want to talk about it. So it's that open encouragement diversity model in action. And that's why I hardly ever see <coughs> Apple doing anything with education because what they used to do was try and get the sceptics and have arguments with Android people, say my Android's better. You say, well, for you, it probably is. If that's all you want to do, have a nice time. We'll go and talk to someone who's prepared to talk about and ask a question. How does your iPhone work? Is your iPhone 6 better than the 5? Why would I get a 7? Will I get an Apple Watch 2? And have a conversation about choices. Gary, is that iTunes U that you're referring to? It is, iTunes U. That uh, symbol there with the hat. Oh, went the wrong way, my mistake. That symbol there with the hat may be on your iPad already. If it's not, it's an app in the iOS, in the App Store for iOS. Um, you get to it through iTunes on the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. So you go into iTunes and then there'll be a little, tiny little button saying iTunes U. Hit that and it just comes on, on your screen. Sorry, Liz. Comes on your screen. Some of the iOS apps, of course, won't work yet on the OS 10. When we get Mac OS, it may be somewhat different. Wait and see, who knows? I certainly don't. So it turns out that creativity and imagination are the key ingredients. And the fact that no one ever, has ever done this sort of thing before, ever, anywhere, is a great motivator for anybody. Anyone in the room would love to have a go at something that no one else has had a go at before. Give me a go, let me at it. Leave me alone for a couple of hours. And it's to the stage now where every student can be a researcher. They can do their own activity and report it. Or well, they need a camera, or they need a microphone. And all these things have got cameras and microphones. So, Osmo. Again, quick survey. How many people have heard of Osmo before, previously? Hmm. Started as a Kickstarter. Began as a Kickstarter, sorry. Um, it's now in the Apple Store. It is spectacular. I've got one set up on the table over there. I would urge you to have a look at it. For anyone aged between, well, 8 and 80 or 5 and 500, anyone who likes playing puzzles, they'll love it. Um, there's a 10 gram puzzle, which is okay. Newton is spectacular, just used as a pen and paper. Doesn't require any special equipment. Words and numbers have tiles that are recognised by the camera and very, very clever augmented reality. It doesn't talk about AR, it just does it. So you put in the stand, clip the mirror on, go. So it's designed for mainstream, it is spectacular. It's another little device on the table over there. Sphero was called the world's first robotic ball. It's now got a friend called Ollie, which is more of a cylinder. But having a cylinder and two motors, you can have the wheels go in opposite directions, so it spins really well. Um, Robotics, uh, TIX is the name of the company. 
in their wisdom in the innovator early adopter stage, they offered the ADEs 200 sets of 10. So 2,000 of these things were given in boxes of 10 to ADEs around the world. And all they had to say was how they're going to use them in their classroom and be prepared to share if someone in a nearby school asked to use them. And that was it. And so they all flowed. Unfortunately, it was late in 2012 when that offer was made and I wasn't able to take advantage of it. However, there are at least three sets I know in Melbourne and the things they've done with it, you could never, ever predict what they're up to. They paint with these things. There you go, there's a challenge. How do you paint with one of those things? Obviously on the floor. Okay, but that's as much as I'll talk about. We'll talk about it at the break. So they're amazing. They just work on iOS. So any iOS device. I've got uh, an iPod Touch here. And there's two iPads over there and they're paired with those. So they're for you to have a go. There's a couple of ramps there. Little ramp, middle size ramp and a big ramp. The Goldilocks ramp is the blue one. However, there's always a daredevil in the group, so the black one is there for you to try. There's a last count about 30 free apps that will do various things, both open and closed. That is, closed, limited functionality, and it basically works. Uh, the open ones you can program yourself. There's an SDK that is a software development kit whereby you can program this thing so it can use the spheroid ball, because it's got accelerometers in it, as a 3D controller for the Parrot quadrocopter. So you've got the ball in your hand here and you can lift it and the helicopter goes up and you can turn it and the helicopter goes to the side because this one works on Bluetooth that one works on Bluetooth. You just need a MacBook Air or Pro sitting in the middle to interpret what's going on. Knock yourself out. It's spectacular. Who would have thought? Uh, there's a thing called Tickle, also free. I do not know how these people, they must have a brilliant day job because these apps are spectacular. This Tickle app locks onto all those devices. So you can actually control an Arduino with your iOS device, the iPad, iPod Touch, iPhone. That's smart house control. These Arduinos cost $6, a full computer, a complete functioning computer for $6. So what can you control with that? Well, take your pick. So the smart home is spectacular. In fact, there's the latest ones don't join to the internet, which is a little bit interesting. Um, you may have heard of code.org. Did anyone hear of Hour of Code? This is a little bit of consumer survey here because there's a big splash about it. You're not necessarily in the education uh, sphere, so you're not necessarily part of the target audience. Code.org has tutorials, lessons, masterclasses on at least eight forms of code that I know of. So Swift, Python, you know, all the heavy duty code and we'll go through and teach you how to use it. And so the code.org um, put together this idea that an hour of code, a lifetime of difference. The headline however and all the advertising just talked about hour of code. So over in primary schools they did an hour of code and thought, oh, we've done well, now what are we going to do? They forgot the next bit of it, that you actually do one hour, then you do another hour, and then you do another hour. And if you've done 10 hours, you might have actually learned something. If you've done 100 hours, you probably know a language. But anyway, again, the late majority will do what they do. Has anyone heard of a thing called Makey Makey? Makey Makey was a Kickstarter. They asked for, I think it was $30,000. And they got $568,000. These are two students coming out of 
MIT and thought, oh, this would be good. And what it is is basically a USB controller. It takes over the control of the uh, space bar, left, right, up, down buttons, and the escape key. Very basic stuff. Unbelievably simple. And you look at it and think, $568,000. Why didn't I think of that? Well, that was the first model, the one that's there. I've got the next model that's over there, which is a USB stick. It actually is even smaller. It's about the size of your thumb. You can have a look at it. It's in the red box there. Take it out and have a look. Um, it's spectacular. And you can use bananas to play a piano. So you set up seven bananas, and as you touch a banana, the computer plays a note. You can put foil across the stairs. So as someone walks up the stairs, they play a note. And so you can dance up and down the stairs playing a tune. You can have tubs of water. When you step into it and conduct electricity through you, this is a really good lesson here somewhere, uh, it makes a noise. So you can jump in different puddles and you could play a game. So you can control the up, down, ping pong type games with these sorts of controllers. So those paddles, the game port paddles basically, that got the Apple II going is what this is all about. So it's basically the game port panels all over again. But this is now 30 years later, and everything old is new again. So they're about, these days, Australian dollars, about $60, I think. Um, you can make it work on an iPad. So you've got these things, and you can touch a banana and control something on your iPad, which it's not that easy. You need a lot of code for it, but it can be done. So it uses the USB to lightning uh, adapter, and away you go. Eric, how would you take that into a classroom learning situation? Uh, you wouldn't. It's a project. It's, it's project-based learning where you're dealing with one student with a bright idea and maybe two others that tag along and say, OK, what do you want to do? Give me your materials list. OK, fine. What's your timeline? So they have to plan their Gantt chart timeline, what comes first, what comes next, what they can do while the other thing's happening. Heavy duty programming from year 11, back in the day, but you can get year sevens doing this, because they have to plan their time. Don't sit around and wait for the paint to dry. Do something else in the meantime. And actually articulate and describe it. And you can have all these projects going on around the place. Now, you, you would be an heroic teacher to take on an entire class letting them choose their own projects. So you'd like to restrict it and have maybe four or five or maybe six in the room that you can recognise what's going on and keep an eye on it. However, some places, the big open learning areas, the learning spaces, have got 100 Year 9 students all doing their own project. Off you go. There's six teachers in the room somewhere, and they're off. Catch me if you can. The kids come early and they leave late. They stay through lunchtime, they come back after school. You can't make year nines do anything. They only do what they want to, okay? 15 year olds cannot be made, yeah, no one can be made to do anything. You can only choose to do things. Make them a better offer. Okay, so this thing came out probably a week ago. We always love the latest. It's a thing called Voxel Critter Creator, and it allows you to do it as a 3D printer in plastic, or for the people that haven't gone that far, in the bottom left here, in paper. You can actually cut out the bricks, a little bit of dexterity, cut out the bricks, make the bricks and assemble it. Three. So voxelbuilder.com. And so there's a pink pig with all its little boxes and they're sort of stuck together. So it's if you like uh, paper Lego. So some really good dexterity going on there, cutting um, that fine motor skill. And why wouldn't you do it? Given the opportunity, 12-year-olds will do this thing. Couldn't go much further without mentioning the Internet of Things, although now it tends to be called IOE, which is Internet of Everything. Currently. I've put a little bit of a dotted line there. I'm not sure you can see it. Currently, we're running at about 6 million devices, all the Bluetoothy things that are around the place. Uh, interesting 
discussion I had with some people from Mathematica. They're dealing with the roads people in New South Wales trying to come up with a better roads model of car travel, speed of cars, traffic density, that sort of thing. And some of the students in Melbourne are doing a similar sort of thing, so we've, we've matched up on it. In New South Wales now, they do not put metal loops in the road to measure car speed or how many cars. They just put a detector on the side of the road, usually an old iPhone, and count the number of Bluetooth going past. 80% of cars have got their Bluetooth on. And so by ca just counting the Bluetooth density, they can tell how fast they go past and how many there are. Really low cost surveying. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, spectacular. Innovative as well. Doesn't cost much. So again, the smart classroom. Well, how's that going to work? I'm not going to talk much about it, but if we can get a smart classroom, it will provide just in time, anticipate needs of teachers and students, monitor what's going on, and adjust accordingly. So if something happens, it'll do something else. So a little bit smart, Web3 if you like. This Bluetooth thing called a beacon, iBeacon was announced by Apple not very long ago, and it went on the hype curve. There's huge hype, and then it's dropped away to little or nothing. Don't hear much about it. However, every international airport in the world has at least a 1,000 beacons installed. They know where the passengers are. So when they finally put out the app, Qantas has put out the app, it knows where you are. And it will serve the map up to you, telling you where the nearest whatever you want is. It will automatically register as you walk in. You'll just thumbprint um, verify, and that's your check-in. It's already set up. So in the States at the moment, they're having races as to who has the most. So Austin, Texas has the most with 5,000 installed. I don't know how you put 5,000 in, but they put 5,000 in. But they're talking about 2D mapping inside. So it's basically indoor GPS. So that's the promise. Now, the reality for those of us that are going to consume the thing, so in this regard, I fit on the graph as a skeptic. Um, we'll wait and see. If it works, we'll use it. If it doesn't work, well, we won't. If it just collects my data, forget it. I'll turn it off. And I think that's the overwhelming uh, message to the advertisers who thought they were going to serve all these ads up to people as they walk down the street. So forget it. People will just turn it off. Smart All. I thought it was Smart L originally. This is a current Kickstarter. It doesn't look like it's quite going to get there, which is a bit unfortunate maybe, but it learns. It's a Bluetooth thing. It's got a microphone and it learns and it turns the lights on and turns the heating on. Answers the phone. So this is on Kickstarter now and someone's put an Arduino processor in it and it does things. It's very, very clever. Um, it costs a lot at this stage, so early adopters pay a lot and get little functionality. Version 2 will be better, version 3 better. Someone will buy them out and they'll go nuts over it. A little bit like uh, Nest was bought out and it's gone very quiet because they're trying to make it into mainstream. So this one thinks for itself and the big selling point for this, although I didn't put it in, it's not connected to the internet. A huge selling point is your home is not connected to the internet. All the Bluetooth devices work, work as short range. If you're in the driveway, it's going to work. If you're outside your driveway, who needs it? So they're beginning to address some of those concerns. When do we want to take the break? This, um, eh? We can have a break and then you, you can continue there. on. Would that you like that? I think, yeah. Or well, people have been sitting a little while. So just before we go into this chapter, um, it's probably appropriate to give you a bit of a rest, have a chance for you to have a poke around um, and have a chat. So I'll meet back here in 10 minutes. Okay.